In this video, we are going to discuss vehicle modeling. Specifically, we will talk about how to model vehicle bodies, tires, incorporate wind and terrain effects, and modeling brakes. This training will be applicable for both the combustion engine and electric teams as it talks about general vehicle modeling. The core example is a half car model with tire and brake models with wind and terrain effects. We would also like to acknowledge and thank the Virginia Tech Formula student team for providing us with data about their vehicle, motors, engines, and batteries for us to use in this training. We will begin by modeling the frame and tires of the vehicle. Since we are modeling the longitudinal dynamics of the vehicle, we will use a half car model. This is because in this case, the loads are evenly distributed between the left and right wheels. Then we will add a speedometer and odometer functionality to measure and validate physical quantities in the vehicle model. We will then explore how wind and terrain can affect the motion of the vehicle. These variables are typically associated with the drive cycle and can be used to determine characteristics like vehicle range. Finally, we will also see how to add a brake model. We will use SIM driveline to model these components. SIM driveline provides component libraries for modeling and simulating one dimensional mechanical systems. It includes models for vehicles, tires, clutches, transmissions, and so forth. This can be used to model longitudinal vehicle dynamics and drivetrain mechanics. Let's switch to MATLAB to see how we can do this. To begin modeling, let's enter the command ssc underscore new in order to open our template simscape model. Let's maximize the model here. Next, we will place the vehicle body block into our model. To do this, open the Simulink library browser, scroll down to simscape, and then sim driveline, and then tires and vehicles to see the vehicle body block here. Drag one into your model. The vehicle body block allows us to model the longitudinal dynamics of a vehicle. Lateral forces associated with steering, inclination or other external forces are not accounted for in the block equations. The vehicle body block has several ports. The block reports the longitudinal velocity at port V the front and rear normal forces, that is the load on the wheels at ports NF and NR. The horizontal motion of the vehicle is represented by the port H. First, let's specify the block parameters. Simscape blocks, like Simulink, can be parameterized using MATLAB variables. The advantages of using MATLAB variables are ease of changing model parameters, running Monte Carlo simulations, optimization routines, and so forth. Here, let's change the parameters of the vehicle body block from their default values to MATLAB variables. These variables are found in a MATLAB script. Let's go back to MATLAB to see this. Open the car underscore tire underscore data script. This has all our vehicle parameters here. The vehicle parameters were provided by the Virginia Tech Formula student team. Let's specify these variables in our block. To do this, let's go back to our model here. Double click on the block to access the block parameters. And let's go ahead and specify these parameters here. For example, the mass here is the rider mass plus the vehicle mass and this is in kilograms, so I'm just going to leave the units like that. The number of wheels per axle is 1 because this is a half car model. The horizontal distance from CG, which is the center of gravity, to the front axle is the variable front underscore axle. This is in millimeters, so I'm going to change the units from meters to millimeters here by typing mm. The next parameter is going to be rear underscore axle. This is also going to be in millimeters. Similarly, we can specify the variables for all the other parameters. After specifying the parameters, select OK to save changes. 
Now let's start connecting the block's ports. The V port of the vehicle body block allows us to measure the longitudinal speed of the vehicle. So let's connect this port to the physical signal to Simulink converter here to measure it. The two ports NR and NF output the rear and front normal forces on the vehicle based on its motion and geometry. These physical signals can be converted to Simulink signals or connected to other SIM driveline blocks. We will use these forces to model tires. To do this, first let's add the tire blocks. These can be found by going to the Simulink library browser. And under tires and vehicles, we have several tire models here. Let's use the tire magic formula block. Magic formula is a popular way to model tires. This block models the longitudinal forces at the tire road contact patch using the magic formula of Poseca. More information about this approach can be found in the documentation. This block also has several ports. You specify the vertical load at port N. The block reports the developed tire slip through port S. The wheel axle rotation is represented by the rotational conserving port A. The wheel axle horizontal motion due to the vehicle is represented by the port H. Let's specify the block parameters as MATLAB variables for this block as well. These MATLAB variables can also be found in our script here. So let's go back to our script. The tire parameter values here are typical sets of constant magic formula coefficients for dry tarmac conditions. So let's go back to our model here and double click on the tire block. Let's parameterize this by constant magic formula coefficients. And here we have several magic formula coefficients that are required. Let's specify the MATLAB variables here. So tire underscore B, tire underscore C, tire underscore D, and tire underscore E. Let's switch to the dimensions tab next and specify the rolling radius of the tire. So this is going to be tire underscore diameter divided by two. And this is in inches, so let's select the unit as inches here. Let's go to the Dynamics tab. For our model, we are not going to specify a compliance. You could specify stiffness and damping values here. Let's specify inertia and an initial velocity for the tire. The tire inertia is given by the variable tire underscore inertia. The initial velocity of the tire is going to be left at zero. Let's switch to the next tab rolling resistance. Let's specify rolling resistance. And this is a constant coefficient, so let's specify this as our variable roll underscore resist. Let's switch to the slip calculation tab next. This specifies the velocity threshold below which the slip calculation is modified to avoid numerical issues at zero velocity. We are going to leave this at the default value, so select OK to save changes. This is just one tire. We need two tires. So let's go back to our model here. Let's drag this block here. Let's delete the Simulink to physical signal converter block because we are not going to be using it. Let's rotate this block thrice using our shortcut control R. We can rename this block to be our rear tire by clicking on the text and editing it. Let's make a copy of this block by right clicking on this block and dragging it. This is going to be our front tire. Let's use the shortcut control I to flip this tire block. And let's rename this block to front tire. Let's go ahead and make the port connections now. Connect the normal force ports of the tire blocks to the front and rear normal force ports of the vehicle body block. This will define the downward vertical load and also specify one tire block as the front wheel and the other one as the rear wheel. So let's go ahead and do that by connecting these ports to the rear and the front normal force ports of the vehicle body block. A number of tire calculations depend on the true velocity at the edge of the wheel. This has two components. The first component is the horizontal component of the vehicle's velocity that is obtained at the vehicle's H port. 
To establish this relationship, connect the tire hub port of both the tire blocks to the horizontal motion port of the vehicle body. We can do this by connecting the H ports of the two tire blocks together and then connecting the horizontal port of the vehicle body to the H port of the tires. The second component is the rotational component of the tire itself. This is obtained at the wheel axle rotation port, the A port of the tires. For this example, let's assume that the front and rear axles are completely independent of each other and are free to rotate without any resistance, barring whatever the tire has. To implement this condition, let's add a rotational free end block. To do this, go to our Simlink library browser and under Simscape and Foundation Library and Mechanical, go to Rotational Elements to find the rotational free end block here. Drag one of these blocks into your system. Note that sometimes it will be useful to hide the block names to maintain a cleaner model. To do this, right click on any block, go to Format and uncheck Show Block Name. Let's go ahead and connect this rotational free end to our A port here. Make a copy of this block and connect it to the other A port as well. Note that we can add actuators and non-idealities to these shafts or even couple them together, for instance, if we are modeling a four-wheel drive car. We are currently not going to use the S ports of the tires. They are used to measure wheel slip. So let's appropriately terminate them by using a physical signal terminator block. This can be found by going to the Simlink library browser and under foundation library and physical signals, go to syncs to find the physical signal terminator block here. Drag one of these into your models and connect the slip port to the physical signal terminator block. Make a copy of this by right clicking and dragging on the block. Flip this block using control I shortcut and connect this to the other tire as well. Now let's connect the solver configuration block to any part of the physical network to set the solver options for our network here. Let's go back to MATLAB and run our script here to populate all the variables in the base workspace. Simulink will read this base workspace for our parameters. Let's go back to our model here. Now we can go ahead and simulate the model to take a look at our vehicle speed. Let's double click on the scope. The vehicle speed on the scope is zero. This is expected since the vehicle was set to start from rest on a flat terrain without any external actuation. Let's place the vehicle model on a half a degree downward slope with a headwind of one meter per second to see if there is any actuation. To do this, let's add two physical signal constant blocks to this model to supply wind and terrain input. Go to the Simlink library browser and under physical signals, go to sources to find the physical signal constant block here. Drag one of these blocks into your model I'm going to rename this to be our wind input. Double click on the block to set its value. Here it's at one, so we can just say okay to save changes. Now let's connect this to our wind port. So I'm just gonna make a little way here with our scope blocks. I'm going to flip this block using control I shortcut and connect this wind to our W port. Note that the W port is expecting the wind to be in meters per second and whatever number you specify in the physical signal constant block is going to be directly applied with that input. Now let's copy this block by right clicking and dragging on the block. I'm going to rename this block to terrain. Double click on the block to set its value. To set a downward incline of negative 0.5 degrees, let's specify negative 0.5. This is in degrees, but the blocks expect this to be in radians. So let's convert this into radians by multiplying it by pi over 180 and then select OK to save changes. Now let's connect this to our beta port here. So let's just make way by rearranging the signals a little bit and connecting our terrain input to the beta port here. Let's go ahead and simulate the model here and take a look at our scope. Let's auto scale this to fit our waveform here. 
we can see that the velocity increases as time goes on in our simulation. Let's simulate this model for a longer time to see if any steady state velocity is achieved. To do this, go back to our model and set our stop time to be something higher. So in this case, I'm going to set it to 300 seconds and then simulate our model again. Let's take a look at our scope again. And I'm going to auto scale. Now we see that the vehicle reaches a steady state speed after about 200 seconds. This is due to the wind, slope and rolling resistance of the tires in the model. Let's go back to the presentation to do a small recap. We started with the vehicle body block from Sim Driveline and parameterized it using MATLAB variables. We used a MATLAB script to populate these variables. The vehicle body block allows us to model the longitudinal dynamics of a vehicle. We model the tires next with the magic formula using the tire block from Sim Driveline. Magic formula is a popular way to model tires. This block models the longitudinal forces at the tire road contact patch using the magic formula of Paseka. We used MATLAB variables for the magic formula coefficients and other parameters like dimensions and rolling resistance in the block. We then simulated this model and observed that the velocity was zero because the vehicle was unactuated. We proceeded to add wind and terrain effects we fed a headwind of 1 meter per second and terrain inclination of negative 0.5 degrees through a physical constant signal block to the vehicle body block. We then simulated the model to see that the vehicle reached a steady state velocity around 200 seconds on a constant incline. Next, the vehicle body block contains an output port for the vehicle velocity. Additionally, if you were interested in the vehicle's position, you could integrate the signal. However, Let's use Simscape sensor blocks to separate the vehicle model from the sensors in terms of functionality and to directly sense the vehicle position. Let's switch to MATLAB to see how we can do this. To create a sensor system in our model, let's add an ideal translational motion sensor block from the Simscape library. To do this, go to the Simulink library browser and under Simscape and Foundation Library and Mechanical, go to Mechanical Sensors. Let's drag an ideal translational motion sensor into our model. Velocity is an across variable, so let's go ahead and connect the R port of our sensor to the H port of our vehicle body block. The C port should be connected to a translational reference here. To do this, go back to our library browser and under Mechanical and Translational Elements, drag our mechanical translational reference block. I'm going to rotate this twice using our control R shortcut and then connect this to our C port here. Let's use the sensor block to measure three quantities. Velocity in miles per hour and kilometers per hour and distance in meters. You can do this by making copies of this block by right clicking and dragging on this block and then making two more copies here. Now let's set the output unit of these converter blocks by double clicking on this block. The first one is going to be in miles per hour. Select OK to save changes. Second one is going to be kilometers per hour. So KM over HR. Select OK to save changes. And the last one is going to be distance measurement in meters. So say M and select OK to save changes. Now let's connect our converter blocks appropriately. The port V on our sensor is going to be used to measure velocity. So let's connect this to our first two converter blocks. Port P is used to measure position. So let's go ahead and connect this port to our final converter block here. In order to visualize these signals, let's use a scope block. So right click on the scope block and drag it in order to make a copy of it. We need three signals as an input to the scope block, so double click on the scope block, access the gear icon to change the parameters of the scope block, and change the number of axes to three, and select OK to save changes. Now, let's connect these three converter blocks to our scope block. The shortcut to do that is to select all these blocks, dragging over it, holding down the control key, and clicking on the destination block here. 
Let's also go ahead and name our signals here. So I'm going to call the first signal speed in miles per hour mph. Second signal is going to be speed in kilometers per hour kmph. And finally the last signal is going to be distance in meters. I'm going to reorganize these signal names here so that we can see it better. Now we can simulate our model and take a look at our scope here. I'm going to hit auto scale to fit the signals. Now we see speeds in miles per hour, kilometers per hour and distance in meter. We see that the vehicle reaches steady state speed and travels to around 600 meters in 300 seconds. Let's go back to our presentation to do a small recap. We just talked about creating speedometer and odometer using a translational sensor to measure speeds with different units and distance. In this model, we have a constant terrain. Next, let's add a variable terrain to this model. In practice, the terrain could be non-uniform which can be imported into MATLAB from an external file. To specify non-uniform terrain, we will specify the gradient of the terrain based on the distance that is the odometer measurement. This relationship will be implemented using a lookup table. Let's switch to MATLAB here. To create the lookup table data for this example, Let's define the vectors for vehicle distance and terrain gradient. This data can be loaded from the terrain data.mat file here. By double clicking on this file, I loaded the data. The file has four variables as shown in the preview here loaded into the workspace. Let's analyze this terrain. So we can do that by plotting X position against Y position and we see that this is a slope followed by a flat surface. We can also see the relationship between the distance and the slope of the terrain. To do this, let's go back to MATLAB. Let's open up a new figure and then plot distance against slope. Here we see that the slope changes for the initial part which agrees with the change in the gradient, followed by a flat surface, which is zero slope. Let's use this terrain data in our model. To do this, let's open an existing model. I'm going to go back to MATLAB here and open up vehicle underscore subsystems here. This model has subsystems created out of the components we have already built. The vehicle subsystems here has the vehicle body block and the tire blocks that we modeled earlier. Let's go back one level up. And the sensor subsystem here has the ideal translational motion sensor and the three quantities that we measured earlier. Let's go back one level up. Now to this model, let's add a lookup table block that specifies the gradient of the terrain based on the odometer measurement. To do this, go to the library browser and under physical signals, go to lookup tables and find the PS lookup table block. Drag one of these into your model here and flip it using our shortcut control I. Let's set the block parameters here. Double click on this block. The vector of input values is our MATLAB variable distance, which is the odometer measurement. Vector of output values is the MATLAB variable slope, which is the gradient. Note that we can also set interpolation and extrapolation methods. This determines the method for approximating slope values between two distance points and for slope values outside the distance points that we have specified. Default settings works for us in this case, so let's select OK to save changes. Now we need to sense the distance signal from the sensor subsystem and feed it back as input to our lookup table block here. Note that this is a physical signal that it is expecting and this is our simulink signal. 
The easiest way to do this is to create a new port inside our sensor subsystem. So let's go ahead and access that. By right clicking and dragging on an existing connection port, let's make a copy of this port. I'm going to rename it and I call it distance. And I can flip the block by selecting the block and using our shortcut control I and connect our distance port to our physical signal port here. Let's make sure that the distance port lines up on the right hand side of the parent subsystem. It is on the right, so that is good. So let's select OK to save changes. Let's go back one level up. And now we have the distance port here. I'm going to rearrange this block here and connect the distance port to the input of the lookup table here. The output of the lookup table is the gradient information that the terrain port is expecting. So let's go ahead and connect the output of the lookup table to the terrain port here. Now let's go ahead and simulate the model here and take a look at our scope output by double clicking on the scope. Here on the scope we see that the vehicle accelerates and reaches a peak velocity then starts decelerating ultimately coming to a stop around 36 seconds. This is because of the nature of the terrain, which is a slope followed by a flat surface. Let's go back to MATLAB here. Note that we have several parameters referenced by MATLAB variables in this model, namely the vehicle, tire parameters, and terrain data. We can automate the loading of these variables for ease of use. We can do this by using simulink callback functions. To do this, let's go back to our model here select file, model properties, and then model properties, select the callbacks tab, and select the preload function. Here, we can specify the MATLAB commands that needs to be run before loading the model. In this case, our MATLAB commands are load, terrain, underscore data, and our initialization script, in this case, car, underscore tire, underscore data. Select OK to save changes. And now, whenever you open the model, these two commands will automatically be run to populate your MATLAB variables with the necessary parameters for the models to use. Next, we will add a braking system to the model to manually apply brakes to the vehicle. We will use one of the built-in brake blocks from the SIM driveline library. The brakes will be connected to both the front and rear wheels of the vehicle model. To do this, we need to modify the existing vehicle subsystem to have connections for the front and rear brakes at the respective wheel axles. To do this, let's access the vehicle subsystem here and delete the rotational free end blocks. We will replace them with the connection ports here, so right click and drag on any connection port to make a copy of it. I'm going to call this rear, make a copy of this port here, and then I'm going to call this front. Let's make sure these ports line up on the left hand side of the subsystem. Let's go and click on the front, make sure it's on the left hand side, it is, select OK to save changes. Let's also make sure that the terrain port is the last port on our subsystem on the left. So let's give it a high number here, in this case phi. Select OK to save changes. Now if you go back one level up, you have the rear and front ports and the terrain port as the last port which has the feedback signal from our odometer measurement. Several brake models are available in SIM driveline. To see this, go to the library browser here and under SIM driveline, brakes and detents and rotational brakes, we have all the brake models here. Let's add a loaded contact rotational friction block into our model. This block resembles closest to a disc brake. It has several ports. B is associated with the driving shaft and F is the driven shaft. N is the terminal through which you import the normal force. Let's specify block parameters for the brake. To do this, double click on the block. For the dimensions, let's select the effective torque radius to 280 millimeters 
which is a bigger radius for our application. Other parameters that could be set are frictional parameters like the kinetic and static friction coefficient, the viscous drag coefficient that is used to calculate the drag torque. The block includes a clutch model inside it to disengage and engage brakes. The initial conditions of the state of this clutch can be specified here. In this case, we are going to leave it unlocked so that the brakes are disengaged at the initial position. We will discuss more about clutches in our powertrain modeling video. Now let's go ahead and select OK to save changes. Because one side of the disc brakes is rigidly attached to the vehicle body, let's add a rotational reference and connect to the B port of the loaded contact rotational friction block. The F port will be connected to the wheel axle and the end port to a force value. To do this, let's bring the brake block over here. Let's access our library browser, scroll up to rotational elements and find our mechanical rotational reference and bring it to our model here and connect this to our brake here to the B port. The combination of these two blocks are going to be used to model our rear brakes. For the front brakes, let's make a copy of these blocks by using our shortcut control C and then pasting it using control V here. Let's make subsystem for our brakes. So let's select all these blocks here and use the pop-up menu to create subsystem by clicking on the first element here. Let's resize the subsystem here. Double click it to access it. Now this is going to be our rear brakes, so I'm just going to call this rear brake. This is going to be our front brake, so let's rename this. This is going to be our rear force input. And this is going to be our front force input. Let's make sure that the brake ports line up on the right hand side, which is good. Make sure that the force port are on the left hand side, which is also good. Let's go back one level up. Let's resize this block again. Let's go ahead and rename the subsystem as well to brake subsystem. Now we are ready to connect the brake subsystem to the rest of the model here. Let's go ahead and connect the rear brake to the rear axle here and the front brake to the front axle here. The force inputs here should be provided as physical signals. To do this, let's use Simulink step blocks. Go to the Simulink library browser, scroll up, under Simulink, go to sources, and then find the step block here. Let's drag one of these blocks into our model and bring it in front of the brake subsystem here. Double click on the block to configure it. Let's fire the brakes at 20 seconds and from an initial value of zero Newton, go to 100 Newton. Those are the values for our step block. Select OK to save changes. In order to make it easier to read the parameters of this block, let's set block annotations. To do this, right click on this block go to properties, go to the block annotation tab. Let's bring in a couple of tokens here. We are going to bring in after and we are going to bring in time. So we are going to say after so many Newton at time seconds. Select OK to save changes. Now it says 100 Newton at 20 seconds. Let's make a copy of this block. This is going to be our front brake force. Double click on this block and let's set this to fire at 25 seconds and a final value of 200 Newton. Select OK to save changes. Notice that the block annotation automatically updated. Now we are ready to connect this to our brake subsystem. Notice that these are simulating signals, however these are physical signals. So let's convert them using our converter blocks. Go to our library browser, scroll down to Simscape, and then Utilities 
to find our simulink to physical signal converter blocks. Let's drag one of them into our model and connect the step to our simulink to physical signal converter block. Make a copy of it and make the connection here as well. Let's go ahead and connect our physical signal block to the converter blocks here. Before simulating the model, let's remove the headwind FX by double clicking on the wind input and setting that to zero and select OK to save changes. Let's go ahead and simulate the model here and take a look at our scope output by double clicking on the scope. I'm going to hit auto scale to fit the signals. Now notice that the vehicle stops earlier around 25 seconds. Recall that without the brakes the vehicle stopped at 36 seconds. We can also see the front and rear braking forces are applied at two different instances at 20 and 25 seconds respectively based on our step input blocks. Let's go back to our model here. When analyzing vehicle models, we may also need to view the values of the normal and longitudinal wheel forces, axle torques and wheel slip. Let's access this vehicle subsystem here by double clicking on it. Tire and vehicle body blocks already contain physical signal ports for wheel normal forces and slip. Measuring these quantities in Simulink simply requires a physical signal to Simulink converter block. But what if we need longitudinal wheel forces and axle torques? We can use ideal force sensor and ideal torque sensor blocks for this. These blocks can be found by going to the library browser here and under Simscape and Mechanical, go to Mechanical Sensors to find our blocks here. Let's take a look at an existing model where these sensors are already implemented. So I'm going to go back to MATLAB. Let's open vehicle underscore brakes underscore measure. Here under the vehicle subsystem, we have the ideal force sensor and the ideal torque sensor. The ideal force sensor measures the longitudinal wheel forces and the ideal torque sensor measures the axle torque here. Let's go ahead and simulate this model here and take a look at what will be these values for the front wheel in this case. Double click on the front wheel quantity scope here and auto scale to fit our signals. We can see in the normal force plot here that at 20 and 25 seconds brakes are applied which causes a spike. Braking shifts the effective weight to the front of the car as opposed to accelerating which shifts the effective weight to the back. This is why you see the increase in the front wheel normal force here. Let's go back to the presentation to do a recap. We added brakes to the model. We used the built-in loaded contact rotational friction block and actuated the brakes using force inputs. Then we saw that the vehicle stopped earlier than before. Finally, we talked about adding more sensors for analysis. This enables us to validate simulations against specifications. For instance, we may check that there are always non-zero normal forces on the wheels when the brakes are applied or the vehicle is accelerating rapidly. Or we can also use it to test control algorithms. For instance, we could use the wheel longitudinal forces or slip measurements as inputs to traction control systems. In summary, we talked about modeling vehicle bodies, tires, wind and terrain effects, and finally brakes. This concludes this video.